Hello and welcome to the, the lecture about correlation and regression. Uh, today we're going to learn about correlation and regression, linear regression. Um, let's start with histograms. Uh, there are five characteristics to look at of a histogram. Uh, the first is central tendency. Does the data have a natural central tendency? That is a typical average score in the middle and then equally distributed on either side. Is there variability? That is a spread of scores around the mean. Do they bunch or do they spread out? Is there a pointy or a flat distribution? Um, uh, is there a skewness and what sort of modal characteristics are there? Is there one peak, two peaks, or more than two peaks? So this is some data that shows some fairly good central tendency. There is a mean in the middle and the data is spread around it. Um, this is an example of two types of variability. On the left you've got a small amount of variability. Everything is more bunched up. On the right there's a fairly um, larger amount of variability between the two. Uh, between the two distributions. Ketosis refers to whether it's a pointy, a flat um, distribution. On the left we've got a pointy distribution, on the right we've got a flat distribution. Skewness can be symmetrical or non-symmetrical and if it's non-symmetrical um, we've got to determine whether it's right skewed or left skewed. Just remember the direction of the tail refers to whether it's left or right and we also make the differentiation whether it's positively or negatively skewed. Um, a mode refers to the number of peaks on a histogram. Um, on the left we've got a unimodal, in the middle bimodal, on the right we've got multimodal, that is more than two peaks. Remember we want to, we ideally want unimodal data. So to refresh, these are the five things we look for. Ideally our data has a central tendency, good variability. Um, it's got pointiness to it, it's not uniform or flat. Very little to no skewness um, and it has, and is unimodal. Um, we're going to now generate a scatter plot which is going to so show an association between two variables. Uh, we need to make sure that we're using the correct um, variables to generate scatter plots and do uh, correlation regression on. So we should define the difference between categorical, that is using categories variables, and numerical uses numbers. Um, we want our data to be numerical. If we had one ordinal or one nominal variable and also a numerical variable, we'd be using ANOVA rather than regression. But if we have two numerical variables, that is an IV and a DV, we can generate a scatter plot like this. Now this has plotted people's anxiety, that is their response to an anxiety scale, versus their response to a depression scale. Um, as people's anxiety scores increase, so do their depression scores. Um, each point on there represents one person's anxiety score where it meets with their depression scores. There is a line going through the middle that best summarizes the relationship between the data and we'll discuss how we get to that in a minute. There are seven aspects of a scatter plot that you need to go through. The first one is, is there a linear relationship? The second one is, it po if so, is it positive or negative? The third one is, well, if it's not linear, is there a better way to summarize the data? Um, if it is, is a straight line the best? The fourth question is, what is the strength of the association? That is, is it very, um, is the gradient very strong or is it weak? Is there a high correlation? Are there any gaps in the data? And where are the outliers? So going back to our scatter plot, yes, there's a linear relationship. I would say it's very, uh, it is positive. It is a, that the straight line was sufficient to sum up the data. It was moderate to strong relationship because we've got quite a um, steady gradient. There is a high correlation. There does not appear to be gaps. There's a couple of outliers on each side, but nothing really drastic. Um, we're looking for really drastic outliers to say anything about and even then at this stage we don't really do anything. Um, this sort of sums up what the difference between the different correlations are. If we had to draw a line of best fit through the top three, you see the first one there is no correlation between the variables, whereas the second one there is a little bit of a negative and the third there is a little bit of a strong. So what we come up with is a variable called R. R tells us two things. It tells us about the strength and the direction of the variable. If R is positive, 
the direction is positive, if r is negative, the direction is negative. The closer r is to 1 or minus 1, the stronger the association between, or the stronger the correlation rather, between the two variables. So if we compare r of 0 0.5 in the top right and 0.9, you see that at 0 0.5 there's quite a lot of variance around the line on either sides, whereas an r of 0 0.9 there's not much variance, so that line better summarizes that data. R is also talking, also known as Pearson's R and is also known as the correlations coefficient. As I said, it tells the strength and direction. There's a quick table to talk about strength between the two variables and also the direction between the two variables. A p-value will tell us whether there's a significant relationship between the two variables. Remember that um, a p-value is always testing a null hypothesis. So if you go back a slide, we're testing for whether there's a significant relationship. The null hypothesis is that R equals zero, or in the population we denote that with a P, that is P for poi equals zero. So um, that's the null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is that P is not equal to zero. So ten essentially we're testing whether Pearson's R is equal to zero. Um, in this table we can see uh, a, an R value, which is minus five point uh, f sorry, minus 0.541 um, and it's got two asterisks which tells us that the p-value is significant um, at the bottom it tells us that it's significant at the 0 0.01 level normally you'll be satisfied with anything less than 0 0.05 as being significant so in this case for the one that's highlighted it means that self-esteem and depression are significantly negatively related to each other let's move on to linear regression now how we can actually apply um, those principles that we've just learnt. Remember we can use either the point and click or syntax to generate SPSS output. We're not going to go through SPSS in this um, 10 minute summary of correlation regression. Um, it's just too much to fit in 10 minutes. Uh, so looking at table 1 that comes out from SPSS in, linear, uh, li in a linear regression is table 1, the model summary. This tells us the R and the R square nothing that we previously didn't know but the r squared is probably worth talking about r squared is r times r it gives us a percentage of which we can say variable x is accounted for x percent of ver in variable y and variable y accounted for percent of variable x so in the above situation we could say anxiety accounted for 25.3 percent of um, the variation in depression score and vice versa the next table tells us that there is a significant relationship between the two variables um, as the sig part of that table tells us. Um, that lets us know that yes, it was worth running this linear regression between these two variables. If we look at the first table, there are several things in that table which are important. This is a dummy table that will tell you where to look for the IV, the DV, the y-intercept gradient significance level. So if we go to the output from that previous table and we look at anxiety, depression, um, sorry, the effect of um, anxiety on a depression score, we can then go and look up the y-intercept, the gradient, the significance level, what the IV was and what the DV was. If we pull that out of the table, we get as follows. We are going to now put that into the equation of a straight line. The straight line will best summarize what is in that data. So if we normally are used to y equals y axis plus y axis intercept plus slope times x, this can be translated into depression equals 13.782 plus 0.62 times anxiety. So remember we get those numbers from at the bottom there, y intercept and gradient. So we can do three things from this. We can discuss the y-intercept, we can discuss the gradient, and we can also give a score, a sub for another score. So the first comment we can always say is when a person's independent variable, in this case anxiety scale, is zero, their dependent variable, in this case depression score, is equal to the y-intercept, in this case 13.782. We can also say for every one unit increase in the independent variable, there's a um, gradient increase in the person's depend in the dependent variable. So in this case it's anxiety and the gradient was 0 0.620 and the dependent variable was depression. We can also substitute into the equation at the top for different levels of anxiety to solve for a depression score. So given anxiety score of 20, person depression score is 26.182. There are three assumptions we need to test in 
linear regression. Um, the first is normality, the second is linearity, the third is constant variance. This is to test normality. We're looking for snaking around the line. In this case there is a bit of snaking but not a lot. Um, we will let this slide. We're looking for major snaking. The second plot looks like this. What we're looking for in this case is massive non-symmetricalness around either of these lines. In both cases the the data is fairly evenly distributed on either side of both lines. If it wasn't, we would say that it may be violating the assumptions of equal variance, uh, sorry, constant variance and linearity. So this is testing normality, this is testing equal um, variance and normal uh, linearity rather. Thank you very much and that is all. Please stay tuned for another one please visit the website as well. Let's get statistical.